faith during times of trouble. If you're a Christ follower, you probably didn't sign up for that. You, uh, you probably thought, oh, this is going to be great. Everything will turn out wonderful in my life. Now I'm a Christ follower. Hey, how'd that work out for you? Even Jesus said, look, if they persecuted me, you're going to get it too. So just get ready. Just get ready. You know, we've been talking about now for uh, this whole year, 2022, about transformation, transformed, multiplying ourselves. And when we talk about being transformed, that's what we talk about when we mean becoming a disciple of Christ. When you become a disciple of Christ, you're transformed. Your mind is transformed. Your thoughts are transformed. Everything. Don't you wish your body could be transformed? Okay, it don't happen. He didn't, he didn't say that. Okay, that's up to you. But transformed. And that transformation is, you know, a lot of times, and, and I may get this wrong, so bear with me if I do. Y'all know I get things wrong every week, so that's all right. But I remember hearing a story one time about how when a, a moth, you know, makes its, I mean, like a, a caterpillar makes its uh, cocoon, and then when it comes out of the cocoon, obviously it's a beautiful butterfly, right? Well, I remember reading a story that some folks had, had tried to uh, fix that and make it easier for the, for the caterpillar to come out of the cocoon. And the, the, the butterfly came out and it died. Well, what they found out was that the struggle of coming out of the cocoon is what gives the, the butterfly strength enough to fly. Now, ain't that something? We all want to fly, don't we? You know? But what about if it's that struggle of coming out of that cocoon that gives us the strength to fly? So we want to talk about that. And, and you know, we, we, are, we are dealing with, let's just be honest, we all face times in our walk with Jesus where we just don't feel very victorious. We don't see stuff going on around our lives that, you know, we don't feel very uh, fruitful. Uh, we just don't, you know, some, and we just call these dry seasons. Just dry seasons. And during these times, and everybody has them if you're a Christ follower, and if you don't have them, then you're a liar, uh, and you need to repent of that. Uh, but dry seasons, and these things, listen, they're they're just inevitable. It's going to happen. And in these dry seasons, we feel like we're alone. We feel disconnected. We feel helpless. Now, let me tell you this, too. One, one just, just thought just occurred to me. The worst thing you can do when you're in a dry season is stay away from your church family. And for some reason, that's the first thing we want to do. That's the worst thing to do. You need to be around your church family in those dry seasons, Okay. Because that's where you're going to gather some strength. And that's where you're going to gather. So, so you know, dis, you may feel disconnected. You might feel helpless. But I want to assure you, and Jesus assures us of this, is that transformation is totally possible during these dry seasons. When you feel like things are just falling apart, when things are not going the way you want it, when you, I mean, I've, I've had times in my life where I've, I've literally said out loud, God, where are you? You know, I'm doing all the stuff. Where are you? And that's, dry seasons are just so challenging. So, if they're going to happen, we need to be ready for them. Bottom line, okay? So let's talk about this a little bit today. You know, whenever we go through major changes in our lives, it really shakes us up in ways that we don't expect. Okay? And I mean, I'm talking about major changes. So, there's, there's a psychological term for this that's called this. The term is loss of orientation. In other words, you, you, you face some sort of relational, emotional, physical trauma, whatever it may be, and, and you, just, you just lose your orientation. It's like you don't, you don't know which way is up anymore. Okay? You, you just don't know which way is up. And uh, it may be, I was just thinking of some of the different things that some of our folks here in, in Stony Fork have experience, maybe you, maybe you lose your job. 
And that throws you into a tailspin. Maybe you change jobs. Okay? Maybe you change schools. And whatever those are, that always changes our relationship dynamic. Any change like that happens. And, and, it, and it's, it's going to change those dynamics. Maybe you get a divorce. Okay? Maybe, maybe you break up with somebody you've been dating for a long time. Whatever it may be. Uh, maybe somebody you love dies. Somebody close to you. Listen, anytime there's change or anytime there's loss, there's going to have to be grief, okay? If you lose, your, if you lose your, your relationship, you've got to take time to grieve through that. If you lose a grandchild, you've got to take time to grieve through that. If you lose, you know, your health, you've got to take time to grieve through that. And all that stuff happens. So whenever we go through this loss of orientation, our lives, I don't know about you, but my life just feels like total chaos, it's just like all around, okay? And, and we can't put, a, I can't put my finger on why. Why is all this chaos going on? And then when this happens, sometimes it's very easy for us to say, well, God, where are you in the middle of all this chaos? I thought you were supposed to be with me all the time. And look, look what's going on around me, and where are you in this? You ever felt that way? I know you have. I know you have. But here's the great thing. Thankfully, when we go through those times of chaos and when we're saying, God, where are you in the middle of all this and everything, that doesn't mean we have to try harder and do more stuff to get him to be closer to us. Let me tell you who that is telling you to do that. The devil. He's the one. He's trying to make, well, you ain't doing enough stuff. I remember, I remember that feeling. He said, Scott, you're not doing enough stuff. That's why you don't feel close. So I started doing all this other stuff. And finally, God had to sit me down and say, hey, Bo, it ain't stuff I want. Quit doing so much stuff and just listen to me. So thankfully, when, when, when we lose sight of God in all the chaos, he's still there. Trust me, he's still there. Okay? But that doesn't mean start trying harder and doing more stuff. When you try harder and do more stuff, you're turning to religion. And that's something you don't want to turn to. What this means is when, when, when we can't see God in all the chaos and when, the, when every ounce of us inside wants to say, God, where are you? What that means is that we should stay steady through the dry season and we need to lean into Jesus during the chaos. Okay? Again, our natural tendency is to lean into everything else but Jesus. Just lean into Jesus. Press into him. Lean into him. Okay? Lean into him. Stay steady. Stay steady. And lean into Jesus. Now, Jesus got some great advice about what to do when we hit these crazy, chaotic, dry seasons. So let's look and see what he says. We're in the book of Matthew today, and I'm reading from the Christian Standard Version. And uh, Matthew 11, verse 28. Now remember, our Bible's divided in two parts, Old Testament and New Testament. Old Testament's to your left, New Testament's to your right. Matthew's the first book of the New Testament, and we're in uh, chapter 11. And so let's see what Jesus says here. Come to me. All of you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take up my yoke and learn from me, because I am lowly and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is Light. Look, Jesus says in the midst of this chaos and all this stuff, when you are just totally worn out, you're burnt out, you, you ain't got nothing left, you know, you're just weary and super tired of this whole thing. He says, look, I know what it feels like to be weighed down by life. And he says, look, you don't have to do more work to get out of your dry season. All you need to do is, like I said a while ago, be steady, rest in Jesus, and then wait on him to grow us and guide us through that. So Jesus is saying in this passage, he's saying, look, what I want you to do is when life is going crazy and you're in this dry season and everything is going crazy around you, 
Press into me and let me carry the burden for you. Let me carry the burden for you. And sometimes we fall into this trap of believing that our faith is always supposed to be on fire uh, or a constant stream of spiritual winds and all that. You realize that's why so many people rededicate their lives to Christ? It's not because they lost their faith. It's because they just don't feel like they've got their faith anymore. Okay? So you got to do something. you got to make another commitment. you got to do this, do that. you got to do this, do this, do this. And, and when we don't have all these spiritual winds and when we don't have, have this spiritual high that we're supposed to be on, we feel like, well, God, am I really saved? Or is it God even there anymore? Maybe God left me. God doesn't like me anymore. Uh-uh. Folks, that's not how life works, okay? We all go, we talked about this before, we all go through dry seasons in our life, and we all go through seasons full of excitement and joy and revival and all that kind of stuff. And, and then we go through these seasons, these dry seasons, like I said, where you just don't feel fun or excited anymore. Sometimes, quite frankly, it seems boring. You ever been there? Like you walk with Christ, you're just kind of bored? Like, I need something new here. You know, I need something new. We said it, we're going to say it every single sermon in this, in this four-week series. Not feeling God's presence does not mean he isn't there. Not feeling God's presence doesn't mean he's not there. He is there, folks. God promised you he's going to never leave you or forsake you. He can't break a promise because he's God. So he is there. No matter how dark things get around you, he is there. And remember what we said last week, we're going to say it this week and next week and the next week. Our feelings are not good indicators of how close to God we are or how far away from God we are. Your feelings are just that. They are feelings. Sometimes you're going to feel close, sometimes you're not. And the great thing about this is this. When, when you don't feel it, the first thing we try to do is fake it. Oh. When you don't feel close to God, you try to fake being close to God. And God's like, please, please, please. God's not wanting you to fake it. If you have to fake something, that's the devil telling you, you ain't right. Anytime you feel like you have to put on a mask, who do you think's telling you to do that? The devil. Now, I know y'all thinking, is this Flip Wilson? Now, some of you don't have a clue who Flip Wilson is, I know, but some of you older people like me do. You know, and he had this thing, that, the devil made me do it. You know, and every preacher in the world said, the devil doesn't make you do everything. Well, sometimes the devil make you put on a mask. He'll encourage you, say, well, you're not good enough, so you need, oh, you're going into church today, and your life is just sour, your spiritual life sour, and you're going to the church today, so you best put on your face. Praise God, glory, hallelujah, everything's beautiful. I would just, you know, one time, one time in my ministerial career, I asked somebody, I said, how you doing? And she looked at me and she said, you really want to know? I said, yeah. She said, my life's terrible. Everything's falling apart. My husband, I mean, she just started spilling out this stuff. And, and I'm like, and, and you know, after about 10 minutes of that, I'm thinking, I didn't really want to know all that, <laughs> you know. But she's probably the only person I've ever met who really just, pardon the expression, just vomited it all out on me, you know. Now, I know in senior adult circles, we like to have what we call the organ recital. You know, when you get together, well, my, my, my gizzard's messed up or my saccharelliac's messed up or my gallbladder's blowed up or my, you know, this, that's why you talk about your organ, your, your organ recital. So, come on, y'all work with me here. I worked, come on, come on. I cut grass yesterday working that one up. Come on now, give me a hand. All right, but don't try to fake it. You know, somebody told me the other day, fake it till you make it. No, you don't fake it till you make it. You keep steady and you walk through the storm. 
God loves us and he is with us in the exciting times when all the stuff's going crazy, fun, fun crazy, and in the routine times when the stuff's going lousy and, and chaotic and all that. God is with us in all this. So in these transitional times in our lives when, when you know, we, we, we've lost that orientation, you're going to feel tossed around. But Jesus says, wait, wait, just come on and rest. Just come on and rest. And, and the reason he says that is not so that we can do more stuff for him, so that we can just sit and rest in him. Boy, Diana did such a great job in that series she did last year about the finished work of Jesus and the resting in the finished work of Jesus. You know, and I'm not talking about, I'm not talking about like a take a day off Sabbath rest. I'm talking about resting in Jesus. Resting, putting the full weight of your burden in your life on him. So we all face these tough times, these chaotic times, these, these dry seasons. And what they do is they challenge us to face the facts, deal with them, and then move on. Okay? In school teaching, we used to call it monitor and adjust. You just monitor and adjust. You may have worked, you know, 42 days on your lesson plan, and when you get there, it just don't work right, school teachers. Am I there? Mm-hmm. So you have to monitor and adjust. You might have worked years on your spiritual life, and when you get to where you think you're supposed to be, somehow it ain't right, so you have to monitor and adjust. You can't pretend, listen, you can't pretend that bad stuff doesn't happen because it does. You can't pretend your lives don't get turned upside down because they do. And you can't pretend that you just don't have to deal with this stuff, this, you know, the loss of your dreams and all this hard stuff, because you do have to deal with it. If you don't deal with it now, you're going to deal with it later. One of the things we say in recovery is what you can reveal can begin to heal. And you got to admit, dude, I am messed up. Like Derwin says, I'm toe up from the flow up. You got to be able to. You got to be able to admit that, and you got to say, you know, man, I, like this is just not what I. This is not what I signed up for. Loss of dreams, man. How many of us have lost dreams? We had these big, grandiose plans of everything we'll do, and you know, where are you now? Great thing is we're not identified by our dreams, and we don't find our identity in our dreams. Life's going to throw you some curveballs. Man, I'm sitting there watching the baseball game yesterday, and this curveball, that pitcher threw that curveball, and boy, it popped that guy around the back of the hand, and he hit the ground, 100, 102 mile, 103 mile an hour fastball. Hit that guy, and that guy fell to the ground. His hand was all crunched like this, and he got up, and, he, and, and the, the guys, the, the commentator said, he's going straight to the x-ray, and he never came back out. Man, you could tell that dude was hurt. Guys, that's what life throws at us. Man, we're up there in the batter's box, and we are ready to go, and sometimes that curveball comes and hits us in places we weren't ready for. And it hurts, and we fall to our knees. We're holding our hands. We're holding our hearts. You know, the thing I found is, man, you hit yourself with a hammer or hit yourself on the hand, you can shake your finger and, you know, say a few of them words you don't want to repeat. But man, when your heart gets broken, what do you shake? When your dreams are broken, what do you shake? When you're in chaos, what do you shake? So life's going to throw curveballs and heart fastballs, and they're going to hit us, and they're going to knock us off of our comfortable, predictable apple cart. But the great thing is, folks, we, when that happens, you don't have to reinvent yourself. You don't have to, you know, you don't have to find this new purpose to go out and save the world or anything like that. All you do is just reorient yourself to the one who's given you the purpose in every circumstance, and that's Jesus. You get back up and you get back in the batter's box and say, okay, boy, that hurt, but I'm ready to take another one because Jesus is here with me. When dry seasons come, and they will, trust me, you have not been abandoned by God or by Jesus. God is right there in the midst of it. He's waiting for you 
to rest in his comfort. While, and, and when you do, he's going to say, all right, now here's the next step. And here's what you need to learn from that. That's the way God is. So let's break this down just a minute. We're going to move on kind of quickly here. Let's just break this down. Just the invitation that Jesus gave us. He says, look, come to me, all of you who are weary and burdened. That's everybody. If you're weary and burdened, Jesus says, come on. Now, aren't you glad he didn't say, come to me, all you who are rich, or all who you poor, or all who are uh, intelligent, or all, all who are musicians, all who are actors, all who are painters, all this stuff. No, he said, come to me, everybody. If you are tired, and if you are burdened, and if you are worn out, and if you are about to throw it in, and if you feel like, you know, you're just burnt out completely. Come to me. Listen, Jesus is saying, look, if all the chaos of this dry season in life is weighing you down, and if the burden is too much for you to bear, then come to Jesus. I know that sounds like a duh statement, but that's the truth. Why don't we go everywhere else? And Jesus says, look, and we're going to talk more about the yoke in a minute, but when we accept the yoke of discipleship and transformation of Jesus, then we're going to find rest in him. And when we find that rest, we're going to experience it in our lives. The, listen, the storm may still be going, but you're going to rest in the middle of it. You're going to rest in the middle of it. So, Jesus uses three commands in this invitation, and I spoke them kind of loudly when I was reading it, but let's just break this thing down. First thing he says is come. Now, what you have to understand in the context of this is that the Pharisees and the religious leaders of the day, they didn't say come, what they said was do. You got to do this, you got to do that, you got to do this, don't do that, don't do this, do this, do this, do this, do this, all that kind of thing. They gave you a list of stuff you had to do and stuff you couldn't do. And they tried to make people, and they literally burdened. I mean, it was like, it's like, okay, that's not enough weight on this person, so let's put some more weight on them. Let's give them some more rules and regulations. Jesus came to do away with all those rules and regulations. The law, as the Pharisees call it. The Pharisees said, do. Jesus says, come. Don't you love that? I just picture it like this. The Pharisee says, do. And Jesus says, come. Religion says, do. Jesus says, come. When we come to him, that means we put our trust in him. And like I said before, this, is, this invitation is to everybody who is willing to admit that they are ready to throw in the towel because they are so burnt out and exhausted and burdened down. So the first, the first thing he says is come. The second thing he says is take. Now this goes deeper, okay? Coming to him is one thing. Taking from him is another thing. We're going deeper, all right? We're going deeper. When we, come, when we come to Jesus, that first invitation, he's going to give us rest. And what that means there is, is we're going to get peace with God. In other words, salvation-wise, we have peace with God. We're no longer enemies with God. We are, we are at peace with God. But when the second thing is when we take his yoke and we learn from him, then we find rest. And that's a deeper rest and an obedience and what that rest means is the peace of God. So as a Christ follower, when you become a Christ follower, you have peace with God. And as you rest in Jesus in the middle of the storm and in the middle of the sunny day, you have the peace of God. Now, let's talk about this yoke thing just a minute. There's so many people that use all kind of different variations of what this actually means. So I've really tried to go back, you know, just go right back to the root of this thing. In, in Jesus' day, if you took a yoke, that meant you wanted to be a disciple. Every, every, every Pharisee and every religious leader had their own ideas about the law, okay? And to take a, to take a, a religious leader's yoke meant that you were taking those ideas about the law and putting them on yourself, okay? 
That's what the yoke was. Yes, it, it has to do with you know, the picture of ox and all that kind of stuff with a wooden yoke and all that kind of thing. But what it was, it was like you're taking, you're taking whatever the belief worldview system of that particular religious leader, you're taking that and you're putting that on yourself with the hope that eventually you're going to have your own yoke so you can put your own spin on that so that people would want to take your yoke too. Okay? So... Um, I love what Jesus says here. The word when he says, uh, it's, it's easy, my yoke is easy and light. What that means is well-fitting. Jesus' yoke is tailor-made for each of you individually. Tailor-made for you each individually. Now I'm going to tell you, y'all may find this hard to believe and you probably will. Back a long time ago, my brother and his wife, he was stationed in Korea. And he called me up one day, he said, and, and, and at that time I played in a band, uh, as I do all, all the time. And, but at that time we were, play, we were in tuxedos all the time. Okay? Can you, can you picture me in a tuxedo? <laughs> Good figure. I'll sell you a picture one day. Uh, but so we wear tuxedos. So my brother called me up we were from, from Korea, and he said, hey, I got an idea. He said, I just, I'm having some shirts made from this tailor in Seoul, Korea. And he said, I know you like tuck shirts. He said, so let me, ha let me have you some tuck shirts made. So he handed me the phone or Cindy the phone and she got the tape measure out. And the guy, the Korean tailor was telling her exactly what to measure and how to do all this stuff and everything. And I thought, this is stupid. You know, this is just, you know, well, about six weeks later, I get this package from Korea, and there are three silk tuck shirts in there. And folks, I'm going to tell you what, and I'll tell you this to this day. If, you don't, if you've never had a shirt tailored for you specifically, you ain't living life. Those tuck shirts fit me better. And I, and, and I even told the guy, I'm a drummer, i got to move my, he said, okay, i got all that, i got it, you know. And, and I'm telling you, guys, it was a joy to, I can't, oh, I can't believe I'm saying this. It was a joy to put on that tuck shirt. Because it was tailor, custom fitted for me. Jesus is calling you up and saying, look, man, I got the tailor right here. And he is creating a yoke for you that is going to fit you perfectly. So let's walk through this thing and let's put this. That's the way, it, man, it, like I said, it was such a joy to put on those shirts. It is a joy to put on the yoke of Jesus because it is a perfect fit. <coughs> and and it's, everybody's, everybody's different. So what he's saying is, look, the burden of doing my will is not a heavy one. I studied up on this, and this is the truth. I'm not making this up. The Jewish rabbis talked about putting the yoke of the law on their students and about how heavy it was going to be, not only to carry, they, they were going to have to carry this huge load, but they were going to have to get used to carrying this huge load. So the law... The law of Moses was this yoke, and, and I ought to say the law of Moses and the, the Pharisees because they added, you know, what God gave them wasn't enough, so they added a whole bunch more to it, okay? So the, the law was the yoke that was purposely put on you to make it unbearable. Aren't you so glad Jesus took that yoke off of you when he picked up the cross beam of the cross? Jesus says, my yoke is nothing like that. And Jesus used this very familiar phrase that everybody around him knew exactly what, they were what he was talking about when he said, take off that burdensome yoke of the Pharisee-style law and just put my yoke on you. So that's the yoke we're talking about there. Now, when he says learn, that's the third command of this, learn. The, the first two commands, you know, kind of, kind of come out of a crisis. You come to me and you, you take from me, you yield to me. But the third thing, the learning is a process. As we go through this transformation, 
We learn more about Jesus. We find a deeper peace in him because we trust him more. Folks, when the storms come, if you learn to trust him in this storm, then the next time a storm comes, you're going to remember what he did in that storm, and it's just going to keep going, and you're going to get more and more at peace even in the middle of the storms. So life, when you take Jesus' yoke, life is just simplified and, and unified around the person of Jesus. And Jesus said, look, all of you who are weary and heavy laden, burdened down, come to me. And this is, this is Christianity explained in one sentence. You give him the full weight of all your sin and your troubles and your worries. You put it all on him. We are notorious for giving Jesus some stuff and keeping some stuff back. Jesus said, look, just dump it all on me. I'm big enough to carry this. I can handle this. These people, the, 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 the thing that the Pharisees did was, was they just made the people feel so burdened and like failures because they failed over and over and over to keep the law. And the Pharisees reminded them all the time, you fail to keep the law, you fail to keep the law. Don't you just, aren't you so glad Jesus doesn't remind you that you failed to keep the law? He reminds you that he is the law and he, he came to fulfill the law and you ain't got to do all that mess anymore. I'm getting excited. I don't know about you, but I'm excited. Maybe it's 4th of July and think about hamburgers, hot dogs, barbecue tomorrow. I don't know, but I'm getting excited. So when we give Jesus the full weight of our sin, we, we just don't, you don't give him just some of it. You give him all of it. And it's just not the weight of your sin that you give to Jesus. You totally give him all of that the inability to obey God because we can't obey God on our own. Only the power of the Holy Spirit can we obey God. So, and listen, I want to tell you, following Jesus does not make your problems disappear. I'm just going to say that. There are some people who stand up and will tell you that today, that, you know, you're going to live your whatever life, you, you know, it's all good and you're never going to have a problem. I ain't sure, I, I ain't going for that. Jesus is real clear. You know, if you want to ask, if you want an example of this, look at the book of Jeremiah. Jeremiah started out, Jeremiah 1, he was a young kid, and God says, Yobo, come on, me and you are going to work this thing out. And Jeremiah says, what? And, and God says, look, Jeremiah, you, you, I know you're young, but you go out there and you say everything I tell you to say, you do everything I tell you to do, and you're going to be a pillar of iron. Nothing's going to stand against you. You're going to blow it up, dude. And Jeremiah says, sign me up. <laughs> I got God on my side. Sign me up. Woo-woo. So he was doing it, man. 19 chapters, he was blowing and going. He was saying tough stuff to kings and everybody else. He didn't care what he said to nobody. He was up in their face because God told him to be in their face. Bloom, 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 bloom. Get to Jeremiah 20. There's this priest. Why is it always a priest, a religious guy? Why do religious people always throwing water on what God's doing? We do that in church, don't we? God's about to bust up on something. We try to make a committee out of it. Thank God here at Stony Fork, we ain't got no committees. We got elders and we got smart people like you that know how to make decisions. That's what we do. I'm just saying. I'm just saying. But anyway, so there's this guy named Pasher. He's a priest. Pasher don't like what Jeremiah's been saying. So Pasher says, uh, go out and get my Jeremiah boy. Take him out there in the middle of the parking lot where the stocks are. Strip him buck naked, put him in the stocks, and beat the daylights out of him. So they do that. Here's Jeremiah, buck naked, in the stocks, in the middle of the parking lot, getting the daylights beat out of him. And finally, finally, the pastor takes him out of the stocks, he just falls down. And I love the next verse that Jeremiah says, in Jeremiah 20. Listen to what Jeremiah says. God, you tricked me and I fell for it. <laughs> You ever felt like that? Look at y'all look at me like, who's a fool? I'm a fool for Jesus. I don't care who you are. God, you tricked me and I fell for it. You said I was going to be a pillar of iron. You said all this stuff. And here I am buck naked in the stocks getting the daylights beat out of me. You ever felt that way? God, you tricked me and I fell for it. But you know what the next thing he says is this. 
real, honest, authentic moment. He said, God, but, but what am I going to do? If I stop talking about you, your word is going to burn like a fire in my soul. So don't tell me when God, when, when you get on God's plan that everything's going to, you know, that you ain't going to get in the stocks and you ain't going to be buck neck and get the daylight speed out of him. Now, I don't want to see that. I just had a picture in my mind there, and I don't want to get that picture in my mind. But you see what I'm saying? Jeremiah's a living example of the fact that you can follow God and still end up in, in dire straits. Okay? So here's the thing. Following Jesus does not make their troubles disappear. Jesus never said, if you follow me, you will no longer have troubles. What he did say was that the weight of them will decrease. They won't be so weighty. Let me show you something here right quick. Y'all bear with me. All right, this is a great Yamaha speaker here. We got three of them hanging up here. We got one right here. These boys are heavy. I ain't playing my younger day, I could huff this thing around. Okay? These things are heavy. But this is a Yamaha speaker. Hey, thank you. I did lift with my knees. <laughs> now, I don't know how much this thing weighs. Probably 100, 100 and something pounds, I guess. I don't know. Probably more than that. But let me show you something. Jesus says, look. Come to me, all you who are burdened down by the weight of all the mess going on, and I will help you with the burden. This is Jesus. This, say with me, this is Jesus. Now, the speaker still weighs the same, doesn't it? Has not changed, has not been on a diet, has not done the keto plan, none of that stuff. It still weighs exactly the same as it did when I picked it up down there, right? But watch this. I feel like Lucille Ball up here. Look, see how easy it is? The weight is still the same, but what I put my weight on made it easier to handle. Come on. Come on. The weight, the weight of all your struggles, the weight of all your sin, the weight of all your chaos, the weight of all your mess you're going on may still be the same, but when you put it on Jesus, it is so much easier to deal with. And the great thing about that is when Jesus says, come to me and give me all your trouble, what he gives us in return is all of him. He, has, he gives us everything he's there. So when we put the full weight of our sin on him, he in turn gives us his righteousness and pardon for our sin. We are counted righteousness in Christ because Jesus has obeyed the law because he knew we couldn't obey the law. But God says, because of what he's done, I see his righteousness and not your... Uh, unrighteousness. And when we come to Jesus, we rest in him with the peace of God. And, and Jesus said, look, you're going to find relief from bearing the load. Relief from bearing the load. That word learn is so important. It's exactly the same word that's translated in the Great Commission where Jesus says, go and make disciples. Jesus is basically saying, look, understand when you put all that on me, take my yoke, learn what it means to be my disciple and to be transformed, and you'll find rest for your souls. Now, I'm just going to say this. Let me push this on over here out of the way right quick. As long as Jesus is one of many options, he is not an option. As long as you continue to be stubborn and want to carry your burdens alone, you don't need a burden bearer. 
as long as your situation brings you no grief, then you don't need any comfort. And as long as you can take Jesus or leave him, you might as well just leave him. Because Jesus says, I won't be taken half-heartedly. But Jesus says, when you mourn, when you get to the point of sorrow for your sins, and when you admit that you have no other option but to cast all your cares and your mess on me, when you understand that there is truly no other name by which salvation is called, and you cast all your cares on him because he is waiting in the middle of these dry seasons. Listen, that's the key, man. At the end of the day, the Christian life's not... It's not about doing what you and I can do in and for the kingdom in our own effort. Guys, I'm going to tell you, that's a recipe for failure. I've tried that. Following Jesus is about him living in and through us on a daily basis and the Holy Spirit being the one that empowers us. When he helps us in our struggles with sin, in our battles with temptation, in our suffering with trials, and when, when, that, when we've lost perspective on everything, believers who are in yoke with Jesus... Understand the fact that, that, listen to this, the one who calls us to righteous living is the same one who enables us to righteous living. The one who calls you to trust God is the very one who enables you to trust God. And the one who calls you to preach the gospel to the nations is the same one who empowers you to preach the gospel to the nations. Folks, that's what Jesus is. That's who Jesus is. He is our Savior. Jay, the team's going to come on up. We're going to close this thing up. Where are you in all this? Some of you today are Christ followers. You are dyed in the wool, card-carrying Christians. You, got, you, know, you, are a, you are a Christ follower, but your life is just miserable right now, and you're wondering what you did. Listen, you didn't do nothing to get out of the grace of God. You can never get out of the grace of God. Some of you just need to say, Jesus, I'm, I'm so tired of trying to carry all this on my own. I'm going to put it on you. I'm going I'm to do just like Scott did that speaker on them wheels. I'm tired of carrying that speaker of sin, gain, shame, and guilt, and all the other stuff. And I'm going to put it on you. Now, the cool thing about that is when you put your sin and your shame and your guilt all on Jesus, that weight goes completely away. Maybe the weight of your situations are still there, but your shame, your guilt, your doubts, all that stuff goes completely away. The weight of that. Some of you just don't know who Jesus, you know, some of you, some of you have been sort of said, well, I'll take him or leave him. Well, today's the day for you to take him. And to do that, you just say, God, I admit that I'm a sinner. I admit that I'm a lost and I have tried to do this thing on my own and I can't do it on my own. And if you're who you say you are and can do what you say you do, then save me. That's admitting. And then you believe, you believe he can do it. You put your trust in him. You say, I believe that Jesus died for me. I believe that Jesus can free me from my guilt, my shame, my sin. I believe that Jesus wants to lighten the burden of my daily life and all the chaos around me. I believe that my sins are forgiven. I believe that my eternity is secure. I believe that, God. And you just confess it. You simply say, Jesus, I want you in my life. Jesus, thank you for saving me. Thank you for forgiving my sins. Thank you for giving me eternal life with you. And thank you for carrying my burdens. Listen, whatever God's telling you, every person in this room has got a next step that you can take to move one step closer to God. Whatever that is, the Holy Spirit's telling you that right now. You just act on what the Holy Spirit's telling you. I'll be right over here on this little stool if you need to chat, if you need to talk, if you just need to pray. You come here and pray up here. You can pray at your seat, whatever you want to do. Our prayer team is scattered throughout, and they'll be glad to pray with you. Whatever God's telling you to do, you do that right now in Jesus' name.